What's up guys? Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be diving into Genesis chapter 11 verses 5 to 9. Genesis chapter 11 verses 5 to 9. I'm so glad to be back with you guys. We're going to do this Bible study. We're going to get this done so then I can go out to dinner with my daughter. We're going to the movies. I think we're watching like Super Mario or something like that. So we're going to dive into that. We're going to dive into this Bible study and then, then I'm going to dinner with my daughter. So that's what we're going to do here. So Welcome back, guys. I want to thank you very much for watching my live stream as I explain the how to how to Bible study Genesis chapter 11 verses five to nine. In this video, you'll learn about the principles of interpretation and how to use the life application study Bible and how to do online Bible study. Take this opportunity to learn the how to Bible study Genesis chapter 11 verses five to nine from my own personal perspective. I hope this video helps you to better understand the principles of interpretation and how to apply the, the Bible to your everyday life. Be sure to join in the live stream and ask questions and get help as you study this important passage of the Bible. We are coming with more live streams like this every day at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So make sure that you subscribe and you like this video. I want to thank you for being here. With that being said, let's go right into our creed. Our creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Celestial Church of Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. And we all say, Amen. Marissa says, Good evening, everyone. I hope everybody had a wonderful and blessed day. Happy birthday, OP. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Marissa also, also says amen to the creed. Yes, thank you very much, Marissa. I appreciate that. Let's move this out of the way. Marissa, I got your prayer for today. Um, if I don't read it, make sure you remind me to read it for everybody. Um, so guys, yet let, um, we talked about yesterday. Let me tell you about what we talked about yesterday in Genesis chapter 11, verse four, it was one to four. Um, we, we spoke about, um, we spoke about the last part we spoke about was James Montgomery Boyce and what he said. Um, it reads, I'll read it to you. It's the great tower had a representation of the, of the heaven a zodiac upon it. Astrology, which focuses on study of a zodiac, originated in Babylon. Turn to any book on astrology and you will find that it was the Chaldeans, another name for the inhabitants of Babylon, who first developed the zodiac by dividing the sky into sections and giving meaning to each of, of each on the basis of stars that are found there. A person's destiny is said to be determined by whatever section or sign he is born under. From Babylon, astrology passed to the empire of ancient Egypt, where it mingled with the native animism or polytheism of the Nile. The pyramids, the pyramids were constructed with certain mathematical relations relationships to the stars. The phoenix has a st astrological significance. It has the head of a woman symbolizing Virgo, the, vir the virgin, and the body of a lion symbolizing Leo. Vir um, Virgo is the first sign for the zodiac. Leo is the last. So the phoenix, which incidentally means join it in Greek, it is, it is the meeting point of the zodiac indicating that the Egyptians, priests, 
believe that starting point of the earth in relations to the zodiac lay in Egypt on the bank of the Nile. By the time the Jews left Egypt from Canaan, astrology had infected the population there. Hence, some of this strict, strictest warnings in the Bible against astrology dates from this period back in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 and Deuteronomy chapter 18. Still later, astrology entered the religious life of Rome. The interesting thing about these biblical um, denunciation of astrology is that astrology is identified with the demonism or Satanism in the sense that Satan and his hosts were actually being worshipped in the, in the gifts of the signs or planets. This is the reason for the Bible's discern or, or stern denunciation of these practices. So that's what we studied last. And so now we're going into um, judgment. God actually intervenes. Like the title says, God intervention in Babylon. We're going to look at what we're going to look at is judgment here. And we're also going to look at anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic language. The anthropomorphic language, that's what we're going to dive into. So without further ado, let's dive into the study. Let's read Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 to 9. If you can open up your Bibles to that, and we'll begin to read. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united, and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that time, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. And that, if you recognize this as God's holy word, type in the comments, amen. Michael says, good evening, OP. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you had a blessed and wonderful day. Michael also says, um, oh, Mike is having trouble getting in. Okay, so Michael Michael is here. He said that he was here. He says, amen to the creed. He says, amen to the reading of the scriptures and Marissa as well. Okay, with that being said, Let's dive into this baby. Guys, going into judgment in the um, anthropomorph anthropomorphic language, um, we see here is the intervention of God to restrain man's godly godless purpose. There were three significant facts that we see here. God saw the secular city and false religion the people were building in verses five. We see that. When scripture says that God came down to see the city, this is what is called the anthropomorphic language. This simply means that human traits are inscribed or ascribed to God. God already knew about the, the secular city and great tower. Scripture is just using descriptive language to give us a clearer and more interesting picture of what happened. What really happened was this. God saw the godless purpose of the people. So he came down to the earth. He came down to earth in a judicial action to judge them. What we also see is throughout the throughout history, God has often allowed the evil purpose of man to continue to take their course. We know this because we see this in we've seen this in Hitler and in Stalin and other who have sought to build a world empire, enslaving and slaughtering millions to achieve their ends, but not this time. Not when Nimrod had united the whole human race to build a, a one world empire and religion. Why? Four reasons was given um, by scripture in this. The, four, the one reason is God saw the unity, the single minded purpose of the people covered in verse six. They were one. They were they were they were as one people, as one body, they, 
um, set on a single purpose, and that purpose was godless. God saw the one language of the people in verse 6 that we see also. They were able to communicate and understand one another without any problems. They had the same concept, thoughts, and mind process that enabled them to plan and to execute their plan effectively and efficiently. And again, their plans and actions were secular and godless. God saw that the people had been um, capable, um, had the capability or had great capability. If they were left on their own, left as a one people with one language, they would succeed in building a godless empire and tower of religion. Before we go further, let's look at Marissa's scripture and see what she has to say. We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 18, verse 21. Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18, verse 21 says what? I am going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The Life Application Study Bible tells us this. God gave the men of Sodom a fair test. He was not ignorant of the city's wicked practices, but in his fairness and patience, he gave the people of Sodom one last chance to repent. God is still waiting, giving people the opportunity to turn to him. Covered in verse in chapter two, um, excuse me, second Peter chapter three, verse nine. Those who are wise will turn to him before his patience wears out. Also, she gave, she put up Psalms chapter 18, verse 9. Psalms chapter 18, verse 9 tells us what? Psalms chapter 18, verse 9 tells us what? He opened the heavens and came down, and dark storms, clouds were beneath his feet. The life application, well, there is no life application study Bible, which is good, which is not good, but it doesn't, which is good because we could keep moving. Okay, so let's go back to the scriptures of where we were at. And we were pretty much hovering in verse 6. We also seen that God saw the people had a great capability, and we went through that. But the fourth part is God saw the the pride of their imagination and the evil of their purpose in verse 6. He knew all about the rebellion and godless purpose in building the secular city and religious tower. God knew their imagination, how prideful and egotistical man was, that man wanted to gain fame, to gain recognition, to gain power, to gain wealth, to get, to be honored, to be his own person, to govern his own life, to do what he wanted. God knew man's imagination, how prideful and egotistical man was, that man did not want to admit that he need he needed help that he could not build the right the right kind of society and world by himself that he is sinful and depraved and cannot be cannot bring utopia the glorious empire to earth through his own effort these are the reasons why god intervened in the building of the city of babylon and the great religion um, tower of babel god knew the godless purpose of man that man was building a city, an empire, and a man-made religion that was to be godless, to exclude God's to exclude God entirely, the only true and living God from the earth. God pronounced his verdict. The verdict was to restrain man's evil purpose by confusing man's language, covered in verse seven. And we see that. Language is learned, and as it's learned, the mind develops the ability to arrange and organize its thoughts in certain ways. That is, the mind of the human race differs. Minds differ as to the way they organize and rearrange or arrange materials and thoughts. Just how the mind organizes and arranges thoughts is determined to a large degree by the language of, a per- of that person. The point is this, though, guys, when God confused the language of the people, their minds, their world of concept and thoughts were bound to be affected as well as their language, their languages. There was a total lack of communication and understanding 
as to the thoughts, concept, and meaning meaning of the other languages. The people simply could not understand one another. They were apparently only an understanding among various family groups that we see. Before we go into the next one, let's look at Marissa's scripture. And she gave Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19 tells us this. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. Amen. It's a good one. Let's continue. Guys, what we also see is God restrained man's evil purpose in verse 8. We see this in verse 8. Verse 8 is right there. He had confused their language. They could, they could not understand one another. Consequently, they slowly and probably over weeks and months drift apart and develop communities and cities of their own. The history of various families is recorded in the table of nations of chapter 10 that we did see. The point is this, though, guys. God stopped the people's secular empire and false religion. He stopped them by confusing their language and scattering them from the face of the earth. But note, note this, God was having mercy upon man, stopping man's evil purpose. We know this, we know this because of the name of God that is used through his passage, the name Jehovah yeah, or Yahweh in verses five to nine. And this is in the, this is in the, um, this is in the King James version. This is the redemptive name of God. God was God was stopping man from building a worldwide godless empire in order to pave the way for man's salvation. If a worldwide empire was allowed to rule the world, a godless empire, then then God would not be able to raise up people through whom he sent the promised seed, the savior of the world. Thus, in confusing the language and scattering the people over the earth, God was stopping man's godless purpose, but God was also preparing to save man by raising up a godless, I mean, a godly people. We know this because we see this in scripture. But before we go to that scripture, let's look at Marissa's in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8 says this. When the most when the most high assigned land to the nations, when he divide, divided up the, the human race, he established the boundaries of the people according to the numbers in their heavenly court. We see that right there. Their heavenly court. Okay. Let's look at there is no commentary, so let's continue. Now let's look at some scripture of what I was what I, what I was pointing out before was the promised seed of the Savior, the the um the confusing language and scattering the people over the earth. God was stopping man's godless purpose, but God was also preparing to save man by raising up a god a godly people. Let's look at Job chapter five verse twelve. Job chapter five verse twelve. Job chapter 5 verse 12 tells us this. He frustrates the plans of schemers, so the work of their hands will not succeed. We see that. And that and that's exactly what happened to this this godless empire that was being built, Babylon and the towers of Babel. We see that. Also, if we go over to Job chapter 12 verse 17. Job chapter 12 verse 17. Job chapter 12, verse 17. Job chapter 12, verse 17 says, He leads counsel counselors away. He strip off good judgment. Wise judges become fools. 
He he leads counselors away. He strip off good judgment, and wise judge become why judges become fools. We see that. But also, let's look at another one. Isaiah chapter thirty seven verse twenty seven. Isaiah chapter thirty seven verse twenty seven says this. That is why their people have so little power and are so frightened and confused. They are as weak as grass, as as easily trampled as tender green shoots. They are like grass sprouting on a house top, scorched before it can grow lush and tall. Scorched before it can grow lush and tall. You see God intervening there. We also see in Let's look at Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22 to 23. This is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 22 to 23, and it reads, God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seems like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain. And makes this make his tent from them from them. He judges the great people of the world and bring them all to nothing. We see that. Right? Let's go deeper. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 11 tells us this. See? All your angry enemies lie there, confused and humiliated. Anyone who opposes you will die and come to nothing. Intervening there, right? Marissa says, um, Isaiah chapter 13, verses 1 to 22. Okay, the whole one. Judgment against pagan nations. Yes, true. Isaiah, son of Amaz, Amaz, received this message concerning the description of Babylon. Great, great scripture. Raise a single flag on the bare hilltop. Call up an army against Babylon. Wave your hand to encourage them as they march into the palace of the, mo of the high and mighty. I, the Lord, have di dictated these soldiers for this task. Yes, I have called called mighty warriors to express my anger, and they will rejoice when I am exalted. Exalt, exalted. Hear the noise on the mountains. Listen as the vast army march. It is the noise and shouting of many nations. The Lord of heaven's armies have called this army together. They come from distant countries, from beyond the furthest horizon. They are the Lord's weapons to carry out his angry his anger. With them, he will destroy the whole land. Scream in terror, for the day of the Lord has arrived. The time for the Almighty to destroy. Every arm is paralyzed with fear. Every heart melts, and the people are terrified. Pangs of anguish grip them, like those of a woman in labor. They look helplessly at one another, their faces aflamed, aflame with fear. For see, the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of the Lord, the, of the day of his fury and fierce anger. The land will be made desolate and all the sinners destroyed with it. The heavens will be black above them. The stars will give no light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will provide no light. I, the Lord, will punish the world for its evil and wicked it, wicked for their sins. I will crush the arrogance of the, of the proud and humble the pride of the mighty. I will make peoples sit, um, scar scarcer than gold, more rare than the fine gold of Orphi, um, Orphire, or Orphir. For I will shake the heavens, the earth will move from its place. When the Lord of heaven's army displays his wrath in the day of his fierce anger, everyone in Babylon will run about. 
like a hunted gazelle, like a sheep without a shepherd. They will try to find their own people and flee to their own lands. Anyone who is captured will be cut down, run through with a sword. Their little children will, de- will be dashed to death before their eyes. Their homes will be sacked and their wives will be raped. Look, I will stir up a me- um, the Medes against Babylon. They cannot be temp- tempted by silver or bribed with gold. The attacking arm, um, armies will shoot down the young men with arrows. They will have no mercy on helpless babies and will show no compassion for children. Babylon, the most glorious of kingdoms, the flower of Chaldean's pride, will be devastated like Sodom and Gomorrah when God destroys them. Babylon will never be inhabited again. It will remain empty for generations after generations. Nomad will refuse to camp there. The shepherds will will not bed down their sheep. Deserts, animal, desert animals will move in their ruined city, and the houses will be haunted by howling creatures. Owls will live a- among the ruins, and wild goats will go there to dance. Hyenas will howl in its fortresses, and jackals will make dens in its luxurious palaces. Babylon's days are numbered. It's time of dis- its time of destruction will soon arrive. Amen to that scripture. What was it? One to, okay, so let's go back up. Let's try to. Okay, Isaiah. Okay, let's look at the Life Application Study Bible and see what it tells us. Chapter Chapters 1 to 12 speak of judgment against the southern kingdom and, to the lesser extent, against the northern kingdom. And chapter 13 to 23 are about the judgment against other nations. Chapter 13 is the prophecy and message from God concerning Babylon. Long before Babylon became a world power and threatened Judea, Isaiah spoke, it, spoke its destruction. Babylon was rarely point of rebellion against God after the flood of Genesis chapter 11, Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Use Babylon as a symbol of God's enemies. At the time of this prophecy, Babylon was part of the Assyrian Empire. Isaiah com- communicated a message of challenge and hope to God's people, telling them not to rely on other nations, but to rely on God alone. And he let them know that great the greatest enemies would receive from God the punishment they deserve. Orpher was known for its rare and valuable gold. It is thought to be to have been located on the southern western, the southwestern coast of Arabia. Even before Babylon became a world power, Isaiah prophesied that though it would shine for a while, Babylon's destruction would be so complete that the land will never again be inhabited. inhabited. Babylon, in present-day Iraq, still lies in utter ruins, buried under mounds of dirt and sand. Very, very good scripture. Amen. Very good deep scripture. Let's look at Revelations chapter 16, verse 19. Revelations chapter 16, verse 19 tells us what? Revelation chapter 16, verse 19 tells us the great city of Babylon split into three sections and the cities of many nations fell into a heap of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sin and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. Yes. So she, so God was not playing with, with them, was not playing with them. Let's go over. Let's continue on with some scriptures that I gave is um, Isaiah 45, verses 15 to 17. Isaiah 45, verses 15 to 17. Again, that's Isaiah 45, verses 15 to 17, and it reads, Truly, O God of Israel, our Savior, 
You work in mysterious ways. All craftsmen who make idols will be humiliated, and they will all be disgraced together. But the Lord will save the people of Israel with eternal salvation throughout everlasting ages. They will never again be humiliated and disgraced. Amen. We also want to we also going to look at um, Jeremiah chapter twenty. Jeremiah chapter twenty. Jeremiah chapter twenty verses eleven to thirteen tells us this. But the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. Before him, my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fail and be thorough, uh, thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of heaven's army, you test those who are righteous, and you examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Let me see your vengeance against them, for I have committed my cause to you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from my oppressors. Amen. That is serious. Now, guys, we go into now, guys, we go into Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. Genesis chapter actually. Before we go into that, before we go into the next session, the next session, the next section is Genesis chapter 11, verse verse nine. But before we get into that, let's go to Isaiah chapter 47, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 15. 47 verses, I'm sorry, verses one to five, one to 15, the whole section. Isaiah's for, Isaiah chapter 47, prediction of Babylon's fall. Come down, virgin daughters of Babylon, and sit in the dust. For your days of sitting on the throne have ended. A daughter of Babylonia, never again will you be the lovely princess, tender and delicate. Take, hev uh, take heavy mild millstones and grind flour. Remove your veil and strip off your robe. Expose yourself to public view. You will be naked and burdened with shame. I will take vengeance against you without pity. Our Redeemer, whose name is the Lord of Heaven's army, is the Holy One of Israel. One, O oh beautiful Babylon, sit down in darkness and silence. Never again will you be known as the Queen of Kingdoms. For I was angry with my chosen people and punished them by letting them fall into your hands. But you, Babylon, showed them no mercy. You oppressed even the elders. You said, I will, I will reign forever as a queen of the world. You did not reflect on your actions or think about their consequences. Listen to this, you pleasure-loving kingdom, living at ease and, and feeling secure. You say, I am the only one, and there is no other. I will never be a widow or lose my children. Well, both these things will come upon you in a moment. Widowhood and loss of your children. Yes, these calamities will come upon you despite all your witchcraft and magic. You felt secure in your wickedness. No one sees me, you said, but your wisdom and knowledge have led you astray. And you said, I am the only one, and there is no other. So disaster will overtake you, and you won't be able to charm it away. Calamities will fall upon you, and you won't be able to, to buy your way out. Catastrophe will strike you suddenly, one for which you are not prepared. Now use your, mag your magical charm, Use the spells you have worked at all these years. Maybe they will do you some good. Maybe they can make someone afraid of you. All the advice you receive has made you tired. Where are you, all your astrologers, those stargazers who make predictions each month? Let them stand up and save you from the future holds. But they are like straw burning in a fire. 
they cannot save themselves from flame. You will get no help from them at all. Their hearth is no place to sit for warmth. And all your friends, those with whom you've done business since childhood, will go their own ways, turning a deep ear to your cities. I mean, to your cries. I'm sorry, to your cries. Amen. 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 That was good. Let's look at the Life Application Study Bible and let us tell us what 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 we see here. Guys, here is predicted. <clears throat> here's the predicted the fall of Babylon more than 150 years before it happened. At this time, Babylon had not yet emerged as the mightiest force on earth, the proud empire that would destroy Judea and Jerusalem. But the Babylonians, Judea's captors, would become captives themselves in 539 BC. God, not Babylon, had to ultimate the, had the ultimate power he used Babylon to punish his sinful people. He would use metal Persia to destroy Babylon and free his people. Caught, caught up in the pursuit of power and pleasure, Babylon believed it, it, its own greatness and claimed to be the only power on earth. Babylon felt completely secure, and Nebuchadnezzar, its king, exalted himself as a god. But the true god caught Nebuchadnezzar a powerful lesson taught Nebuchadnezzar a powerful lesson by taking everything away from him in Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 to 37. Our society is addicted to, the, to pleasure and power, but these quickly vanish. Look at your own life and ask yourself how you can be more responsible with the talents and possessions God has given you. How can you use your life for God's honor rather than your own The people of Babylon sought advice and help from the astrologers and stargazers. But like the idols of wood and gold, astrologers could not even deliver themselves from what was to come from the hand of God. Why rely on those who are powerless? The helpless cannot help us. Alternatives to God are destined to fail. If you want help, find it in God, who has, who has proven his power in creation, and in history. Amen. Good scripture. Okay, so now you guys ready to go into Genesis chapter 11, verse 9, the last one. So let's go into that and let's see what, um, what we're going to get out of that. So what we see here, guys, and now we're going into we're continuing with, with the judgment. This is ba this is Babylon, the Tower of Babel, and God's power being shown here. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, He scattered them all over the world. He scattered them. He scurried them away. Guys, what we see here is the eternal memorial to God's power. The very name Babel or Babylon means confusion. The name was given to the city and tower because God confused the language of men there. Later on, the people of, of the area changed the meaning of the gate of God. Victor Hamilton, the book of Genesis in page 357, you can see that there. But no, no matter what, me, what meaning man tries to give, to the name of Babel. It stands as a memorial to God's great power. When we hear the name Babel or Babylon or hear a different language from our own, we should always think of the enormous power of God, of just what he did at Babel. Both We see both Babylon and the different languages and nationalities of the earth stand as an eternal memorial to God's great power. And what we learned here was that God expected uh, expects us to remember him at every turn of life. It is our duty to remember and acknowledge him in all that we do. We see this and it's proven and it's given to us. If we look at, ah, uh, she tried to get me. 
Nah, you ain't get me, Marissa. Let's let's look at let's look at my scriptures and then we'll look at Marissa's scriptures. Psalms 63, Psalms 63, verse 6. Psalms 63, verse 6. Psalm 63, verse 6 tells us this. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. The like application study Bible tells us this. During his sleepless and uncomfortable nights, David thought about God. He reviewed all the ways God had already helped him, and he greeted the next day with songs of praise. There are many reasons we, can, we, can, we can't sleep. Illnesses, stress, worry, but sleepless nights can be turned into quiet times of reflection and worship. Use them to review how God has guided and helped you. Make it a point to count examples of God's faithfulness to you. A sure way to find some rest. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Proverbs 3, chapter 6 tells us this. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. The Life Application Study Bible tells us this. To receive God's guidance, said Solomon, we must seek God's will in all we do. This means turning every area of life over to him. About a thousand years later, Jesus emphasized this same truth in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Examine your values and priorities. What is important to you? Where is God on that list? In what areas areas have you failed to acknowledge him? In many areas of your life, you, you may already acknowledge God, but it is the areas where you accept you uh, I'm sorry, but it is the areas where you attempt to restrict or ignore his influence that will cause you grief. Make him a vital part of everything you do. Then he will guide you because you will be working to accomplish his purpose. His purpose. Let's take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 says what? Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. How, I mean, honor him with your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I see that one. I'm like, he, that's how it's going to be when I get old, old. So in verses one, it says, um, the life application study Bible tells us this, a life without God can produce bitterness loneliness, hopelessness, and old age. A life centered around God is fulfilling and can can be richer and more bearable when we are faced with disabilities, sicknesses, or handicaps. Being young is exciting, but the excitement of the youth can become a bearer to, to closeness with God if it makes young people focus on passing pleasure instead of eternal values. Make your strength available to God when it is still yours during your youthful years. Don't waste it on evil or meaningless activities that become bad habits and make you callous. Seek God now. You see that. And the last scripture that I will read is, I think it's Jonah. I don't think it's Jonah. Yeah, it could be Jonah. Yeah, it's Jonah. Jonah chapter 2, verse 7. Jonah chapter 2, verse 7. And it says this, As my life was slipping away, I remember the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. You see that? So now let's look at Marissa's scriptures that she so kindly put up. Let's take a look at Psalms chapter 55, verse 9. Psalms chapter 55, 
verse 9. Psalms chapter 55, verse 9 tells us this. Confuse them, Lord, and frustrate their plans. For I see violence and conflict in the city. The Life Application Study Bible tells us this. We'll read down to verse 11. Its walls are patrolled day and night against invaders, but the real danger is wickedness within the city. Everything is falling apart. Um, threats and cheating are, are, are rampant in the streets. What does it tell us? The Life Application Study Bible tells us this. The city that was supposed to be holy was plagued with eternal um, eternal problems, violence, conflict, wickedness, threats, and cheating. External enemies, though a constant threat, were not, not nearly as dangerous as the corruption inside. Even today, churches often look, at def- look to defend themselves against troubles from the sinful world while failing to see that their own sins are causing their troubles. Very good scripture. Amen to that. Acts, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5 tells us what? At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. That was Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10. Tells us what? Crawl into a crawl into caves in the in the rocks, hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. We see that. Now let's go down to verse 21. While they crawl away into caverns and hide among the jagged rocks in the cliffs. They will try to escape the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty as he he rises to shake the earth. That's the end times. Michael says, amen. Michael comes out with a scripture. Michael says, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 4. Isaiah... Isaiah chapter 13, verse 4, tells us this. Hear the noise on the mountains. Listen as the vast armies march. It is the noise and shouting of many nations. The Lord of heaven's army has called their this army today. I think I read that one. Also, we look at Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1, it tells us this. Let the Lord, I mean, sorry, excuse me. Look, the Lord is about to destroy the earth and make it a vast wasteland. He devastates the surface of the earth and scattered the people and scatters the people. The Life Application Study Bible tells us this. I don't know why it's not coming up. I'll just tell you what it says. Hmm. I don't know why it's not coming up, but it says this. Let me see. It says this. These four chapters, 24 and 27, these four chapters are often called Isaiah's apocalypse. This discusses God's judgment on the entire world for its sin. Isaiah prophesies were first directed to Judea, then Israel, then to the surrounding nations, and finally to the whole world. These chapters describe the last days when God will judge the whole world. At that time, he will finally and permanently remove evil. And that is what we have. Michael says, Amen. Marissa says, Amen. Okay, that's what we got, guys. It was a good that was a good study. I like that. We went deep. We went real deep. Marissa gave some really good gave some really good stuff. 
That was some really, really good stuff. Yeah, that's what I have for you guys. So tomorrow, guys, we're going to be diving into Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 to 31. We're going to start on this. We're not going to do all of it, but we're going to start on it. Um, we're going to do, we're going to start in verses um, 10 to 31. What we're going to see here is Shem, Noah's son, and the son chosen to carry out, to carry on the godly seed. We're going to look at, um, we're going to look at um, human history, their failures and things of that nature. We're going to have an introduction to that. And let me just sneak peek down into that. Um, what we'll see, what we'll start doing in part one, we'll do preservation of the promised seed in part one. And that's verses um, 10 to 26. And then the preservation of the promised seed, part two, the beginning of the great life of Abram. Now we go in and now we start going into Abraham, baby. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that one. That's going to be good. Now we start getting into Abraham. Yes, finally, finally. Let me see how, let me see how. Oh yeah, we could do, I think, let me see. Let me see how, oh yeah, they're pretty. Oh yeah, they're pretty short. We should be able to bang this out. Yeah, they're pretty short. It's dealing with four facts. So that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to study tomorrow. Um. Michael says, thank you, OP, for another wonderful Bible study. You are so welcome, Michael. Marissa says, thank you, OP, for another wonderful Bible study, fellowship. Enjoy your, your daddy date tonight. Thank you so much. Yes, that I'm going to enjoy that. We're going to, I got to watch cartoons though, but uh, I guess I'll, at least the food will be good. Um, so hello, Brian. What's up, bro? I'm glad to see you here. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's get to, let's end this out and let's get to our Lord's prayer. Our father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us for all our trespasses, as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and thy glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm so glad you're glad to be here. We're glad to have you here, bro. We're glad to have you here. Thank you very much for being here with us. Those are fun to watch. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be exciting. So yeah, we're gonna. And Brian, I'm so glad to see you here, Brian. Thank you so much for being here. Um, let's do let's do Marissa's prayer. Let's do Marissa's prayer. Marissa says, "Good night, everyone. God bless you, and God bless your family. We hope you have a wonderful, blessed night and day tomorrow. May they both glorify God, His kingdom, will, way, and word." How can we pray for you? Don't do not hesitate to post your prayer request so we can pray for you. We will see everyone tomorrow night and every night at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of today. We thank you for the friends and families we have. We thank you for the blessings of another fellowship. Thank you for blessing OP with the, another wonderful year. Thank you for. <laughs> oh yeah, I gotta I gotta tell y'all that story at the end. Stick around, I'm gonna tell y'all this story. Thank you for blessing OP with another wonderful year. Thank you, Father, for empowering us through your wisdom and word. Thank you for our brothers and sisters and the love they they share. We pray for those who are sick, weary, and lost. Guide them back to your loving and caring arms and ignite the flame inside their souls. Help us put on and keep on the full armor of God every day and all day. Protect the children of this world. We pray for the protection as we go about our day. Pour out your favor and blessings over everyone and their families. We give you all our praise, gratitude, thanks, and glory to you for evermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
men. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely amazing prayer. I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you guys for being here. It's awesome. <laughs> We, we we did this. We flowed with this. Everybody said amen. Mar Michael says amen. Marissa says amen. Michael says, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please, if I have earned your thumbs up, please press the thumbs up button. Also, if you haven't subscribed, you better subscribe so you can be notified when I upload new videos. You know what I'm saying? And I just want to say God bless you and God bless your family. And oh yeah, let me tell you out of my story. So I'm eating. I'm we have we have family over, and they're from California, so we have family over. So they came over, and there and we're eating outside. We grilled outside, and they were like, "This was yesterday." They was like, "Oh, you know the 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 family." They're like, "Oh, um." How old are you gonna be? And I was like, I was like, I'm gonna be 43 years old. I'm gonna be 43 years old. Juan was like, No, you're not. You're gonna be 42. What are you talking about? I'm like, Juan, I'm gonna be 43 years old. I know I am. And he's like, No, you're not. So he was like, I'm 41. You're 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 be 42. You you're not. So. I had the best birthday ever because I did not want to turn 43. <laughs> I was not ready to turn. I did not want to turn 43. And normally I don't keep up with my birthday because it's, you know, I just give it to God. He created me. So I got another year. I don't have to turn 43. So I'm blessed. I am so happy. So um, one of my friends, he, he texted me. He was, I was like, I'm like, yo, I don't have to turn 43. I'm 42. And he was like, don't worry, you're going to forget about more birthdays than that as you get older, because <laughs> they call me old man. So I'm so I'm glad I'm glad everybody watched that. I'm glad everybody listened to that. That was my that was my. Oh, oh, yeah. They, oh, yeah, that's right. Also, wait, hold on. Callie, 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 I know you're watching and I want to say thank you very much for this beautiful card. Happy birthday, OP. Thank you very much for such a beautiful card. And you don't have to worry. I am going to put this on. I'm going to put this on that shelf back there. And I'm going to keep it there for a very long time. As long as it stays standing, I'm going to always keep it there. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart that you. this was an amazing gift. I love, I love, I love cards. I'm a simple person. So I'm a very simple and simple person. I don't want much. I just want to be comfortable. So this made me feel so comfortable. I want to thank you so much. So thank you so much. Also, I want to thank Marissa and the kids and Michael for such an amazing, such an amazing um, card. It says, God is with you every, um, in everything you do. Genesis chapter 22, 21, verse 22. And it says, the Lord is smiling on you today, just as he does every day, because you are a true and shining example of the power of his love. Have a blessed and happy birthday. Always Marissa, Michael, and kids, the Dunbar family. This will also sit on my, my standing back. You will see it in the next video tomorrow because it'll be sitting right up on top. You'll see it. So get ready. You're going to see it. But I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank everybody for being here. God bless you. God bless your family. Um, Marissa says, we love you. I love you guys too. Thank you so, 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 so much for being here. Till next time.
till tomorrow. We're going to dive in. We're getting closer to Abraham. I definitely want us to get some lessons in with Abraham, see what he was thinking about. We just went through a, a very a, a very challenging part of the study because we actually got to see the spreading of the the spreading of the population, the repopulation of the world after the flood. And now we start getting into all the population. Now we start. Now Abraham is here. That's what we do. God bless you guys. God bless your family.